the title of my talk is um, Exploiting High Throughput Sequencing to Tackle Emerging Plant Pathogens. So what I hope I'm going to explain to you is how recent developments in DNA sequencing technologies, how we can actually use those to address disease. And a lot of, I mean, I'm talking about um, diseases of plants, but a lot of what I'm talking about is equally applicable to diseases of animals, humans. And in fact, a lot of the methods we're using in the plant pathology, we're, we're, we're really borrowing or stealing from our colleagues working on human diseases. So um, Vittorio explained this already, but maybe it's worth me um, just explaining what my kind of background and how I got into this. So this is now, 2012. Um, so I've been at Exeter for the last three years. Before that, I was um, head of the bioinformatics team at the Sainsbury Laboratory, which is based on the John Innes Center, at the John Innes Center in Norwich. The reason I mention this is because my job there was really providing bioinformatics support. So what I mean by that is uh, myself and my team, our job was to help solve problems, provide training, um, do analyses on any large data sets um, that our colleagues were generating that involved bioinformatics, computational analysis. So um, a very broad range of, um, of projects, a very broad range of skills um, required. Um, but largely, I was providing support rather than actually leading um, a research group. So maybe a slightly different perspective to what some of the other speakers in this program may be talking about. Before that, um, I was working at the Sanger Institute, which is the big institute in Cambridge that was responsible for doing a large part of the human genome sequencing. Um, but what I was doing there specifically was working on a database called PFAM. Does any, is anyone aware of PFAM? Good. I, I was hoping the answer would be yes. I mean, it's a very widely used database of protein, protein conserved domains used for annotating genome sequences, for predicting, predicting functions of uh, proteins from sequence. So, for this last 10 years here, basically working with computers as a bioinformatician. Prior to that, as Vic mentioned, I um, was a proper laboratory scientist. I worked on molecular microbiology um, for a PhD and a couple of short postdocs. So that's the perspective where, where I come from. Now, I've been involved in lots of very, very varied projects and um, lots of different organisms. Um, but I guess the unifying theme of what I've been doing for the last few years is dealing with large sequence data sets. So large protein sequence data sets, large DNA sequence data sets. And just in the last few years, there's been a very exciting time to deal with um, sequence data, largely because of, as I describe here, a revolution in sequencing technology. So I guess many of you have heard phrases like uh, next generation sequencing. Um, so basically, around about 2006, there was um, a new, ge new generation, a new, a new set of sequencing technologies came onto the, market, onto the market, which really changed everything. So back in about 2005 or before, if you wanted to determine the complete genome sequence of um, any organism, you know, a, a mammal, a, a plant, or even a bacterium, you would, you would have to secure some funding, go along to a big sequencing center like the Sanger Institute. Um, and in these places, there would be um, like a huge air, aircraft hangar, massive, great building, with hundreds and hundreds of these sequencing machines, um, many, many staff, you know, dozens of staff. And months, or sometimes even years later, you would get your sequence data. Then. In about 2006, these new sequencing technologies came on to the market, and now we can sequence whole genomes with a single instrument that sits on a bench here, operated by a single person. And we can do now, um, we can do the equivalent of several human genomes, complete human genome sequences, in a few days, essentially, on one of these instruments, um, for a few tens of thousands of dollars. So massive change in what we can do. Um, this is really just summarizing the same as what I've, what I've said. Um, so the cost of generating DNA sequence back here 
eight or nine years ago, would have been about $10,000 to generate one megabase of sequence, whereas now it's dropped dramatically down to you know, a few tens of dollars. So the point of all of this is we can do a lot of things now routinely um, that we never could have done before um, using sequencing. So we can use sequencing, of course, for genome, sequencing complete genomes, but also other applications like um, expression profiling, all kinds of epigenetic studies, um, and uh, studies of small RNAs, et cetera, et cetera. But um, my particular interest really is in plant pathogens. And in particular, most of my research is focused on uh, these two genera of plant pathogens, Pseudomonas and Xanthomonas. Now, I'm sure you've heard, um, some, well, some of you at least will have heard about these pathogens before. But the point I want to make is, first of all, they cause a wide range of diseases on a wide range of different plants. Uh, many of these diseases are economically important or are important for um, food security. Um, basically, some of these diseases have been responsible for famines, people starving, losing their livelihoods. These are, these are important pathogens, uh, some of them at least. So what's all this got to do with um, sequencing? Well, when this um, new sequencing technology came along a few years ago, one of the first things we wanted to do was um, to be able to sequence complete genomes of bacterial pathogens. And actually, this, um, this wasn't really straightforward at the beginning because these um, sequencing technologies, so for example, the Illumina sequencing technology, this was not really designed for um, de novo sequencing of genomes. It was really designed for um, resequencing. In other words, um, sequencing very close relatives of an organism whose genome was already known. So, for example, um, looking for single nucleotide polymorphisms in individual humans, for example. This technology was not really designed for sequencing complete genomes, and part of the reason for that is, or one of the limitations of this sequencing is it generates very, very short um, sequence reads that are very difficult to assemble into complete genomes. So one of the first things we did um, was to demonstrate that it is possible to generate a reasonably good quality complete genome sequence of a bacterium from this kind of data. So this is what we published uh, a long time ago. And then we went on to use this technology to sequence complete genomes of several of these interesting um, pathogens. So one example. And now it's routine. I mean, we're doing this all the time. We're using these new methods to sequence um, bacterial pathogens. So, for example, this is a recent paper from uh, your colleagues here, um, which I was involved in, and there are many, many, many more of these. We're doing these, these all the time. But it's all very well um, sequencing complete genomes of, of bacteria, um, you know, novel species of bacteria and so on. But the real power of genomics is in comparison of multiple closely related isolates. Um, so this is a common concept in, in medical microbiology now. I mean, there are, um, again, it's, it's become almost routine now to, um, to sequence dozens, tens, even hundreds of um, bacterial genomes. But one of the first examples, actually, was some work we did um, a few years ago on a Pseudomonas syringae. So this is the, the plant pathogenic Pseudomonas um, species. And a particular pathovar of this species, so kind of a, a, um, a subspecies, if you like, that um, causes disease on the horse chestnut tree. The horse chestnut tree is this, this tree that produces the conkers. Um, so what we actually did was um, we sequenced complete genomes of several isolates of this bacterium from, um, from the UK and also from India. The reason for this is because this, uh, this bacterium in the UK causes a devastating disease on trees. I think you can see here that the, the bark is all cracked, um, that the branches are starting to die, and eventually this, this tree will die. 
and something like 50% of the trees in the UK are infected with this. It's a big problem. Now, exactly the same bacterium, or the, the same pathovar of the Pseudomonas syringae, in India um, has been known for several decades. But in, in India, it only causes a very mild disease on, on the leaves. It's basically a leaf spot disease on the Indian horse chestnut. Rather different to this devastating um, systemic disease on, on the trees in, in Europe. So um, what we did is sequenced a, a bunch of isolates from both the UK and also from India, compared those together, and were able to, to get several insights about the um, genetic basis for um, infecting the woody parts of, of the tree. For example, we've discovered some um, clusters of genes involved in uh, degrading lig lignin, so also, we were able to infer um, something about the epidemiology of this, this bacterium. All of the UK isolates were almost identical and therefore probably come into the UK just once. So that was an early example of um, sequencing multiple isolates of, of bacteria using this technology. Another example, which I'm going to only mention very briefly, I believe you had a seminar recently from uh, Professor Scortichini talking about this same, this same topic. Uh, we, we've also done some work on this. So this is another pathovar of Pseudomonas syringae, which causes a very serious disease on kiwi fruits. Uh, big economic problems in, in Europe here. Um, also in other parts of the world, especially New Zealand. And um, again, we, we sequenced multiple isolates of this, this pathogen from various parts of the world. In fact, we, we sequenced complete genomes of isolates of the bacterium from Italy, from Portugal, China, Japan, and Korea. And what we expected was that the China, the Chinese isolates and the Korean isolates and the Japanese isolates would be um, very similar genetically. We, we thought they would be, because of the geography, they would be very similar. And we expected they would be different from the European isolates. What we actually found is that the European isolates, European bacteria causing this disease in Europe, were almost identical to isolates found from China. So literally just one or two single nucleotide polymorphisms over the whole genome, um, distinguishing these from these, uh, rather different from those. So this actually gave us some clues about the origin of this disease in Europe. Um, it almost certainly came from China. So I'm not going to go into any more detail on this because you've heard a, a talk about this recently. What I am going to talk about in a bit more detail is a current research project that we're actively working on. And this is all concerned with a disease on bananas in East Africa. Again, it's a bacterial pathogen that's causing the disease. And this is a disease of great importance in, in East Africa. Um, it's really threatening the production of, of bananas. So quickly, just to acknowledge that I didn't do all the work on this project that I'm going to describe. Um, a lot of the work was done by one of my postgraduate students, Georgina Karamura, um, a visiting scientist from Uganda who spent some time in my lab earlier this year, um, colleagues at a government lab called uh, Food and Environment Research Agency, headed by Julian Smith, and also a close colleague of mine at Exeter, Professor Murray Grant, who I work with very closely on this project and others. So those are the people that did the work. Um, why, why do I care about bananas? Why are bananas important? Um, well, bananas are a very, very important crop for, for food. So if you were to look at the um, FAO statistics, the Food and, food and Agriculture Organization of the UN statistics, um, it basically looks like in the developing world, banana is probably the fourth most important staple crop, um, certainly in some parts of the developing world. It's used for diverse purposes. I mean, it's used to eat as a sort of dessert fruit, but also um, it's widely used for, for cooking, um, for brewing, um, and, and several other, other uses. One really important feature of banana is that it produces... It produces edible fruit all year round. So this is really important for food security during um, parts of the year when other crops 
such as uh, wheat and so on, are not, are not available. So it's a really important um, crop for food security in several countries, especially um, uh, in, in East Africa and other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. So bananas, um, we're used to seeing bananas that look like this in, in Europe, of course, but if you go to um, certain parts of the developing world, you'll see much more diversity, right? Um, you know, here's an example of the diversity of bananas. But it, if we buy bananas from the supermarket shops in Europe, they all look like this. And these are the, a variety called the Cavendish banana. 50 years ago, or maybe 60 years ago, if we went to the shops in Europe, we would find bananas that look like this. And they belong to a different cultivar of bananas called uh, Gros Michel, or Gros Michel. And the reason that we no longer see these on the supermarket shelves in the shops is because this cultivar was completely devastated by a fungal disease, uh, a fusarium disease, completely um, wiped out this, this cultivar, uh, made it economically unviable to grow this. So all of the international trade switched to, uh, to this variety. And incidentally, some of these diseases of bananas uh, are re-emerging, and actually there's a real chance that the Cavendish banana may be uh, no longer um, growable on a, on a large scale because it's being threatened by some of these diseases, especially these fungal diseases. So bananas, um, important crop, challenged by uh, several diseases and pests, um, pests, diseases, including fungi, um, viruses, and bacteria. So the particular disease I want to talk about today is caused by a bacterium called Xanthomonas campestris pathovar musaceorum. Let's just call it XCM. And it looks like this on a plate, yellow, slimy, um, gunky stuff. If we inject it into a banana plant, two weeks later, the plant looks like this. I mean, it's completely dead. And this happens in the field. If your plantation gets infected with this pathogen, um, within a few months, quite often the, the, whole, the whole crop can be wiped out. So where does this disease come from? What, what, what's the history of this? Um, way back in 1968, a wilting disease was reported on this plant. This is called Enset ventricosum. So this is a close relative of the banana that's grown in the highlands of Ethiopia, around about here. So this was described... Um, back then. NSET is um, a plant of local importance. It, for about 10 million people in Ethiopia, this is a really important crop in its own right. And um, so this disease is actually endemic there and is a big problem. So this is the NSET plant. Um, the fruits are not edible on the NSET plant. The, the edible part of the crop is, is down here. So um, this new disease in Ethiopia on NSET ventricosum. Then in 1974, it was reported that this same disease was able to infect bananas. Um, so this was reported in a paper in 1974, again, in Ethiopia. So this is a, an excerpt of that paper. And in that paper, they make this, this uh, statement or this, this plea. Great care should be taken to make sure that this disease does not escape from Ethiopia um, into parts of the world where banana is grown. So that's me paraphrasing. This is exactly what they said. Now, unfortunately, about uh, 30 years later, 40 years later, that's exactly what happened. Um, in, the, in Uganda, in 2001, this disease um, was reported in, in several, several important banana-growing regions of Uganda. This is a very, very worrying development. And then... Um, subsequently, um, it spread out into other areas of Uganda and into these neighboring countries. So the point is, this is a new disease, um, at least on banana. It's very new. It's only been known in banana-growing areas of East Africa for 10, 10 12 years. And um, so it's not really been studied in much detail. So, so what do we know about the pathogen that causes this disease? What, what's its relationship to other other bacteria. So the point I wanted to make here is that 
this bacterium, XCM, the banana pathogen, is very, very closely related to um, another um, Xanthomonas species, or strains from another Xanthomonas species. It's called Xanthomonas um, vesicola. And these strains are pathogens not on banana, but on sugarcane and on maize. And these are found in all many parts of the world on, on sugarcane and maize, where they cause um, a gumming disease on maize, for example. So evidence from biochemical um, studies like fatty acid, methyl, ester analysis, that's the results we're seeing here, show that these banana pathogenic strains are very, very closely related to these sugarcane and um, maize pathogens, and only somewhat more distantly related to other xanthomonas um, pathogens. This is really showing the same thing, but this is based on um, some sequence evidence, just sequencing a single housekeeping gene. Again, the bacterial pathogens, the banana pathogens, very, very closely related to these um, sugarcane and maize pathogens. In fact, they're completely indistinguishable based on the sequence of this housekeeping gene. So, an obvious question then is, are the, given that this banana pathogen is almost indistinguishable from the sugarcane and maize pathogens, uh, this XPV, so they're almost, they're so closely related, they're probably the same species. Um, can these also cause disease on banana? Um, and the answer is no. So um, Georgina, my student, actually tested this, uh, did the, the virulence assays in, in the glass house, thank you, and found that although XCM, the, uh, the emerging banana pathogen, although that is able to cause disease on banana, sugarcane, and, and maize, this closely related pathogen cannot cause disease on banana. Um, so what do the symptoms look like? So this is our banana pathogen, XCM, on maize, and it causes these uh, sort of reddish-brown lesions, um, whereas the XVV, which is the sort of naturally occurring sugarcane pathogen, similar symptoms but rather more severe. So why am I telling you all of this? Why, why is this important? Um, I think it's important because it suggests that this, this, um, this model or this, this origin for, for the pathogen. What we think has happened is that the banana pathogen has recently evolved from this species, XVV. And this species is naturally or historically a pathogen of sugarcane and maize. And somehow some, some strain of this species has um, jumped onto a new host, onto banana, and it has established itself there. It's probably um, become somewhat adapted to living on banana and somewhat less adapted to living on these hosts, which is why the symptoms have become maybe less severe. That's, this is, um, I should say, a working hypothesis rather than a final, a final word on the, on the matter. I should also point out that the um, XCM strain is very genetically uh, monomorphic. There's very little genetic variation in the strains of this pathogen, which again suggests that it's a single strain that's uh, evolved, gone through a population, a population bottleneck to become this new pathogen. So, given the close relationship between our sugarcane pathogens and our banana pathogens, um, yet they're different, they're different behavior, they're different host specificity, an obvious thing to do, if we want to understand the genetic basis for jumping from one host onto another. The obvious thing to do is to compare the complete genome sequences of the banana pathogen versus the sugarcane pathogen. So that's exactly what we did a couple of years ago. This is all published. Um, so I'm not going to go into it in great detail other, th other than to mention the highlights. The highlights really are there are some differences between the sugarcane pathogen and its very closely related banana pathogen. Main differences are in the type 3 secretion system. So I guess you've probably heard about the type 3 secretion system before. But briefly, this is um, like a molecular syringe used by the bacterium to inject effector proteins into the host cell in order to overcome the, the host defenses. And the bacterium will have a, an arsenal of many, maybe 30 or 40 different um, effector proteins that it can use to subvert the host, and different strains, different species of bacterium will have a different set of effectors. 
And there's lots of evidence that the, uh, that the particular set of effectors here has a dramatic effect on the host range of the pathogen. So different effectors needed to infect different hosts. So we did in find, indeed find some differences in the effectors. So most of the type 3 secretion system effectors were conserved both in the sugarcane pathogen and in the banana pathogen, but there were a few um, differences, a few minor differences. So um, if this was an audience of plant pathologists, I would go into a lot more detail about this, but I guess probably a, not of much interest to, um, uh, to much of the audience. Um, there are other differences. There are some differences in uh, a system called the type 4 pillus, which is a kind of a thing that sticks out of the, um, the bacterium and is used for attachment to surfaces, for example, attachment to the host surface. Um, also, it can be used for so-called twitching motility, which is a way of the bacterium moving uh, from one place to another. And also, we found differences in the lipopolysaccharide synthesis gene cluster. So again, this is something which is um, potentially important in interactions with the host, especially um, in, in animal pathogens. This is really important because it's highly antigenic um, and it can be a target for the, for the, for the immune system. Similarly, in plants, um, there's some evidence that the lipopolysaccharides are um, what's called a, a, a PAMP, a pathogen-associated molecular pattern. In other words, um, it, it's a it can be used by the plant to recognize the pathogen, and therefore there's, there's pressure on the bacterium to, to evade that, that recognition. So some, some interesting leads, basically, um, in, in that. But actually what I want to talk about now is some work we've done more recently building on that, um, and this is more concerned not so much with the fundamental biology of the pathogen, but more to do with tracking its spread. Um, throughout the region. So to put this into context, um, obviously this is Africa. The, uh, the red regions here are areas where the banana disease, BXW, banana xanthomonas wilt, these have been confirmed present in these regions. So it's basically around, um, around the lakes here. So around Uganda, the eastern part of Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the northwest part of Tanzania, and several parts of Kenya and also where it was found originally up in, um, in Ethiopia. Also um, Burundi and Rwanda in here somewhere. So that's where, where, the, where the disease has been confirmed so far. But remember, it's only been known for 10 years. Um, there's a good chance that it has gone unreported in other places. So for example, this huge area here in Democratic Republic of Congo, this huge area here, bananas are grown, but we just have no data about whether or not the pathogen is present. Um, there's lots of completely impenetrable forest and um, places that are kind of, you know, you, you wouldn't really want to, to go to to do plant surveys. Um, so the, the extent of the problem could be a lot worse than, than, than we think. And if it ever spreads sort of west into um, Nigeria and Ghana and so on, then we, we, we have an even bigger problem. So it's really important to be able to spread, to, to understand the spread of the pathogen. Um, and obviously, if we want to try and control the spread of the pathogen, we need to understand how it's spreading, how fast it's spreading. Are there particular um, populations that are spreading uh, differently to others? So as I said, originally found in Ethiopia up here, then it spread to Uganda, 2001. Then in 2005, it was reported in um, Congo, 2006 in northwest Tanzania, 2007, it was then in Kenya, Burundi, and Rwanda. So that's what we know from the literature, okay? Now, of course, we, if we want to really understand uh, at a fine scale how the disease is spreading, how individual populations of the pathogen are spreading, we need some kind of markers, some kind of way of distinguishing one population or one individual of the pathogen from another. Now, using traditional plant pathology type methods, I say traditional, this is actually quite cutting edge for, for plant pathology, using um, you know, DNA fingerprinting methods and so on. If we um, compare a range of isolates of our banana pathogen from different geographical locations, they all look exactly the same. There's no, there's no genetic diversity that we can easily find using um, traditional methods. So you can probably predict what I'm going to say next. Um, 
we thought, well, if we can't get to the variation using existing methods, let's use whole genome sequencing and see if we can find some genetic variation using that. So we took isolates of the bacterium, the banana pathogen, from various locations. Um, so we had about four or five isolates from Uganda, uh, one from Kenya, one from Burundi, one from Rwanda, uh, one from Congo. And um, what we did, well, we did several things, but the important thing is we looked for single nucleotide polymorphisms. So you know what I mean by single nucleotide polymorphisms? Just single... So, so changes, differences between one isolate from another, one individual from another, um, differences of just one nucleotide. So um, for those of you that have any interest in what the data look like and how we, how we deal with the data, this slide might be interesting. Um, for those that are not interested in that, don't worry if you don't follow this. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you what, what, what the data looks like. So what we're looking at here is a very small part of the bacterial genome. We're looking at just about, I think, 80 base pairs along here. So you can probably just about see along here we have the, the sequence, the nucleotide sequence um, of part of the bacterial genome. Okay, this is a reference bacterial genome, the thing that we sequenced a couple of years ago. Um, below that, that's just the protein translation of that nucleotide sequence. Now, what we've got on these panels here, so we've got one panel here and a second one below it here. This is data, this is the, the raw sequencing data, if you like, from two different isolates. Um, the data that we get are short sequence reads of, in this case, I think there were 72 base pairs each. So each of these gray bars or gray rectangles is one sequence read spanning about 72 base pairs. And what we've done is aligned them against the reference genome and if the sequence data agrees exactly with the reference genome, then we just have a gray bar. If it disagrees, then we show the, the discrepancy with a, with a letter here. So, for example, we've got a G here in this read that was, I don't know, a C maybe in the reference genome and so on. Now, what you'll notice is that there are some discrepancies randomly scattered around. And these are explained just by the inherent sequencing error, noise in the sequencing data. But occasionally we see um, a very consistent, a very, um, yes, consistent discrepancy, like here. We have, in this data set, all of the sequence reads here are saying that we have an A, whereas in the reference genome we have a G. And in this isolate here, um, there is no discrepancy. All of, all of the data is agreeing with the reference genome, with a G. So I hope you can see from this that it's conceptually fairly straightforward to, to scan the whole genome and um, identify all the single nucleotide polymorphisms from this kind of data. Um, I should say that we don't just rely on the whole genome sequence data. We, we do validate at least a subset of these SNPs using a, a, an assay involving amplification and, and digestion, um, which if anyone's interested in, they can ask me about at the end. But this is how it works, and this is, this is how it looks on the gel. So, okay, so by sequencing these... Um, banana pathogens from various different geographical locations in Africa, in East Africa, <clears throat> and um, comparing those against um, also the, the sugarcane and maize pathogen um, sequences. Well, what do, what do we find? Well, we can build a phylogenetic tree based on, on those SNPs, those single nucleotide polymorphisms. And just as we expected, the banana pathogens all, all make up a single, um, a single clade here, um, which are all very, very closely related to each other and somewhat you know, closely related to, the, to this pathogen and much more distantly related to other um, Xanthomonas species, such as this rice pathogen here. So that's exactly as we expected. Um, but more interestingly, if we actually look at the pattern of those SNPs, those single nucleotide polymorphisms within the banana pathogens, then we see some interesting patterns emerge. So each of these columns here um, is showing the genotype um, at um, each of these positions on the genome. So we've got, that's one isolate, that's another isolate, that's another isolate, that's another isolate. Um, and those are the, this, this is the nucleotide at each of these positions at, at, for each of those isolates. What I hope you can see from this is that there's a bunch of isolates, a group of isolates here that seem to always group together and have a distinct genotype compared with this group over here. 
So what this basically means is that all of our banana pathogens are falling into two major groups, which we're calling sublineage one and sublineage one, sublineage two. Um, and consistent with what we already knew or suspected, they are um, still very, very, very closely similar to each other. So members of this group are 99.9985% identical to members of this group. But of course that means that they're also 0.015% different. So there are some differences, some single nucleotide polymorphism differences between this group and this group. So who cares? Why, why, why does it matter that we've got two groups? Well, if we, if we try to represent these two groups geographically, um, what I've done here is I've taken the members of this group, the isolates from this group, and marked those in the red oval shapes, and the, the isolates from this group in the blue rectangles. And um, so this is the, the pattern that we see. So we've got this group are appearing up here and here, but in all of these other locations, we've got members of, of this group. So this actually is somewhat inconsistent with what we originally um, thought or assumed. If you read any of the literature on this disease, they always say in all of the papers that it started off in Ethiopia, spread to Uganda, and then spread out to these other countries. Of course, that doesn't fit the data that we have because we've got this blue genotype up here. We've got the blue genotype down here and here. Um, and to get from here to here, we're having to go through this red genotype, which doesn't fit with this at all. So basically what this is saying is this model is, is not right because um, we have these inconsistencies here. With, you know, this genotype has not, has not given rise to this outbreak here because they're, they're different genotypes. So we've, what we've probably got, or what we've almost certainly got, is at least two separate waves of introduction of the pathogen into East Africa from here, at least two different waves. So what next? Um, I mean, I think this is, this is actually quite a surprising and important result for, for people trying to work on this disease and try to control it. Um, but it's still rather crude. I mean, we've only got you know, a few isolates from each of these geographical locations. We know almost nothing about, for example, the patterns of spread within Uganda or within Kenya or within Congo. However, that's all going to change because we have this fantastic resource now from our collaborators in East Africa who have just gone out and collected um, a massive strain collection of the banana pathogen from um, what they've done is they've taken, they've visited, they've visited several villages along here. Basically, they've followed along this main road on the west of Uganda here, um, stopped off at various points here. And they've taken, within each village, they've taken... Um, multiple farms, and then within each farm, they've taken multiple plants, and within each plant, they've taken multiple tissues, like um, stems, leaves, um, corms, flowers, and so on. From each of those tissues, they've taken multiple bacterial isolates. So what we now have, then, is um, samples from, you know, amazingly um, small, small, fine resolution um, of, of, of various outbreaks um, of this pathogen. So we can... What we can now do through um, a combination of that SNP-based genotyping and possibly more complete genome sequencing is we can really um, start to pinpoint exactly the, the patterns of spread. So the sort of thing we, we want to be able to get to is, um, let's say these are, each of these circles is, a, is a, a, an isolate from a particular geographical location or a particular, uh, particular farm, particular village. What we're hoping to do now, and what we have the tools to do, is to actually really piece together exactly um, the patterns of spread from, from village to village, um, even possibly from plant to plant. Uh, we can ask questions about evolution within single plants, within single villages. And already, I mean, this is only very preliminary results we have at the moment. Um, so I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into this in detail. But what we are already starting to see is evidence of recombination between the populations. So... What I'm showing schematically here is various populations evolving clonally, evolving in the normal vertical way, that um, the normal patterns of transmission of genetic material like this. But we're starting to see um, 
uh, hybrids, if you like, recombinants between different populations um, within within villages um, between the, between the two geographical regions. So all very exciting stuff. Um, so just finally, I, I, I haven't got time to go into these projects, but um, we are also working on kind of similar projects on several other pathogens, both bacterial pathogens of plants and in the last couple of years, we've been working quite heavily on um, eukaryotic pathogens of trees, Phytophthora species on, on trees, which are a really big problem in, in northern Europe at the moment. So I think that's a good place to stop. And um, thank you all very much for your attention. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions.